and I think it was probably describing a process that had been learned from the experience of first Christian, Christian first century Christians. A second reaction to all of this is, this is works, not grace. And it's very common when the topic of spiritual formation comes up and you get into a discussion of actually doing something, uh, then people are apt to say, well, that's works and not grace. And uh, unfortunately, it's a pretty uh, harmful understanding of grace. Um, Grace is not opposed to effort. In fact, you won't see anyone put out effort like someone who's been touched by grace. Paul being the most obvious illustration. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Grace is opposed to earning, not to effort. Earning is attitude. Effort is action. If we are going to be formed in Christ, transformed into Christ-lockness and out of conformity with the world, it will be because we have done certain things. Spiritual transformation is not a passive process. It does not happen to people. So let me now put it in a slightly different way and say that spiritual formation, Christian spiritual formation, is the process that happens to people in the status of disciple. A disciple is one who is undergoing a process. And disciples can often be, and often are, very green. Being a disciple is not an advanced spiritual condition. And you pick this up clearly if you simply read the Gospels and see how that works. Now thank God for that. We come into discipleship to Christ with no credentials except our need and our understanding that he has welcomed us to life in him, in the kingdom of God. That's where the life of the disciple takes place. And Jesus' teachings about the birth from above is a teaching about entry into the kingdom. And you enter into the kingdom, then you are in a position of a student of Jesus Christ. Now, you have to work out your way of understanding it, but my way of describing the disciple, as I say, I, as a disciple of Jesus, am learning from him how to lead my life, my life, not his, in the kingdom of God, as he would lead my life if he were I. So for each of us, the emphasis is upon our life, I say, as a disciple of Jesus, I am learning from him how to lead my life in the kingdom of God as he would lead my life if he were I. And now we've got a basis upon which we can begin to talk about the process of spiritual formation. Often spiritual formation is set aside because it is assumed to be a form a discarded form of the Christian religion, where people did strange and fantastic things uh, in the past as a way of what they thought was gaining the favor of God. Uh, So we've discarded that form of religion. And much that was involved in it needs to be discarded. For example, the acceptance of uh, monasticism as a preferential or high-level form of life. Now, that's an old story, and you can find it in Eusebius in the third or fourth century of the Christian era, Uh, and uh, it begins to trouble the church. And I 
I don't deny that someone might receive a special calling for them individually into something like that life. I don't think that is a very common thing, to say the least. And I certainly don't think it is a normative form of Christian life. I often point out to some of my friends that Jesus was not a monk and none of his disciples were. That he lived uh, in the ordinary world and for most of his life he was uh, what we might call an independent contractor, a blue collar worker. He didn't start practicing the Sermon on the Mount when he preached it. He had been practicing it for a long time before that as an ordinary person living in the world, making a living. And it's important to, to know that. The apostles also, Paul, for example, and, but all the others, they were not, they didn't adopt that form. So when we think about spiritual formation and we associate it with a discarded form of life, we want to remember that the facts of the case were simply misunderstood in that form of life. And walk out from the misunderstanding, but keep the essence uh, of spiritual formation in discipleship. But now you have to understand discipleship in terms of your whole life and what you're learning to do and to be wherever you are. But under some of these misunderstandings, I know in my own case, I was raised in the framework of dispensationalist theology where people simply said, the Sermon on the Mount is not for today. They made a few exceptions. Uh, forgiveness and, adult and uh, divorce were exceptions, but um, they made a few exceptions. But generally the idea was, you were not assumed, it was not assumed that you would become Christ-like or that you would uh, uh, take on his character. So. This was presented as a version of the gospel for another time. And uh, then uh, Paul and John and uh, Peter were thought to preach a different gospel. And uh, it took me some while as a young minister to work my way out of that. But it finally became clear to me that if you could do Colossians 3, you could take the Sermon on the Mount at a walk. It wouldn't be a problem at all. You can do 1 Corinthians 13. You're not going to have any problem uh, with uh, Matthew 5. Uh, it's all of a piece. And it was a misunderstanding about the gospel that led to that unfortunate uh, circumstance. And you can check all that out just by going back to the old Schofield Bible and reading the footnotes. And then you might like to compare them to the more recent versions to see how things have changed, which is very good. So now then, with all those clarifications, the first question after that is to say, um, are we going to do what the passage in Paul says? Are we going to be transformed through the renewal of our mind? And uh, do we hold doing what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere as an objective? Is this an objective? If the answer is yes, and I'm going to presume it is, uh, we can worry about it later, that we're all going to say yes. Uh, what Paul says, that we are to be conformed by the renewing of our mind, is uh, the legitimate objective of Christian living. Now, uh, I don't see how anyone can disagree with that, but I know that some people do. If the answer is yes, it is the legitimate objective of Christian living to be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of, nine, of the mind, then of course the next question is, how? How are you going to do that? How are you going to come to the place to where the things that Jesus commanded would be routine. Routine, easy obedience. What are the methods? 
Now, we set aside an issue here by saying it isn't going to happen without the grace of God. That's not in question here. Not in question where Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. That's granted. But we need to think the thought that if you do nothing, it will be without him. And so then now the question is, what am I to do? How do I submit my body and renew my mind and become transformed because of that? Now we need to go back to think about where action comes from. Uh, Action uh, comes out of the inner dimensions of human personality. And Dr. Jesus, in Mark 12, utilizing the sources from the Old Testament and changing it a little, tells us that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and our neighbor as ourself. So now I'm going to take that. I hope you will agree with me that uh, Jesus was not just a hayseed that wandered in from the countryside with a straw between his teeth and made wise observations. He really knew what he was talking about. And when he gives us this statement, he is telling us how to move towards the renewal of the person. And so he's saying we need to come to love God with all of those dimensions. All your heart. What is that? What's your heart? Now you can disagree with me about my way I do this anthropology, and that's fine. Um, There's no such thing as a biblical psychology, I think. But I think the heart is your will. I think it's also the human spirit. And I think you can back that up by looking at the scriptures. So your heart. Now your heart is the executive center of the self. It's where decisions are made. The fundamental role of the will in human personality is to rely on God. That's its fundamental role. That's how it comes into contact with a source that enables it to fulfill its vocation given to it from God in creation. But the spirit would then be the will, the executive center of the self. Mind is your capacity for thought and feeling. Your ability to represent things, the response of your feelings to what is represented, and the primary source that the will has in view when it acts. The will as it acts must respond to something that it's thinking of and it must have some feeling, if you wish, about what it's thinking of. And then it can act. And one of the important things to understand here is when the mind goes wrong, the will is enslaved. And if you will read Romans 1 with all of this in mind, I think you'll see how that works. The will can only act from what is in the mind. Now, ironically, sometimes something isn't in the mind because the will has rejected it. And so you have an interplay here between the will and the mind that becomes extremely important when you start thinking about the use of Scripture in spiritual formation. And then the body. The body is your little power pack. God has given you a, an energy source for your life that enables you to even act in rejection of Him. Your body is extremely important in the spiritual life. You meant, you're meant by and large to live from what your body already knows to do. 
If it's speaking a language, driving a car.